everyone, and welcome back to Country Music Made Me. Thank you so much for joining us once again. We appreciate it. Please make sure you are liking, sharing, following, subscribing to us on whatever streaming service you are listening on. Leave us a review, a rating, tell your friends, your family, your neighbors to come on over and have a listen. That support is huge each and every week. Today, we are sitting down with Nate Holler. Now, he's fairly new to the Canadian country music scene as a solo artist, but he is not new to the scene as a musician. For the past 10 years, he has been playing guitar for well-known acts like Kira Isabella and the Recklaws. But he is now ready to step into the spotlight as a solo act, and his debut single last year, Lightning in a Bottle, has shown exactly what he's capable of as it is doing great things at Canadian Radio. So please enjoy our conversation with Nate Holler. Growing up in Waterloo, you're self-taught on the guitar. Now, Mm -hmm. do you have a specific moment or a specific age or moment in time where music really started to grab hold of you in that way that made you want to take that step in learning it? Yeah, I remember like I had picked up a guitar. I couldn't do anything on it. But in my earlier years, I would just kind of bang on it or whatever. Uh, Honestly, until I was like 14. And I saw I saw a concert. It was this Australian guy who played like all these didgeridoos. And he he made these stomp boxes so he could he had like bare feet and he would (laughs) kind of like bang on things. And I that was in high school, like early on. And, um, and I was like, I have to do that. So I started like learning, but when I really, really like knew this was what I was going to do was, uh, like a Christmas assembly or might've been a talent show or something. And my, my friend, Gavin Barry, I'll give him a little shout out. (laughs) He he signed me up and we were going to do a thing together, like perform a song together. And I was like reluctant, didn't want to do it. And then he signed me up and I had to, it was day of, I tried to get, <laughs> tried to get out of the performance, but uh, Miss Reed would not let me, the principal would not, not uh, let me do it. And, and what grade was thank that? Thank goodness. That was probably 10 or 11, grade 10 oh, okay. or 11. But uh, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad she didn't let me out of it because uh, it, it turned into like, from that moment on, I was set hundred percent. When, when it came time to pick electives, there was no more science. Right. There was none of that. <laughs> I, it was anything I could do to, to just do music all the time. And so early on, when you talk about just sort of banging on it and picking at it, who had the guitar in the family that you kind of got accustomed to when you were younger? Yeah, I remember my brother having one and his a couple of our really close family friends, uh, they were playing. But um, I think there was just one in our house always. And just since I can remember and I started started there, I guess. And I need to know about your grandpa because he sounds like an interesting character. He was a radio guy and TV guy. And I think you even have said that he's had, he had drinks with Johnny cash back in the day. Yeah. He, uh, so he says, I don't know. Actually, (laughs) I do have proof because Johnny like uh, signed a message to one of my aunts. Actually, Oh really? So yeah. Um, but yeah, he was in radio and television. Like I, I just remember being like, it's so cool that grandpa does that. I don't even, I didn't know what it meant really. I still, I still kind of don't, I know he was a, a disc jockey for a while and, and interviewed people and he worked his way up to kind of running stations and things like that. But uh, right. he, it was always so interesting that he kind of followed this path that he wanted to do that people tell you like those types of things don't happen, but uh, he just stuck with it. And that, that got me like, I was like, I can do this music thing. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as the rest of the family goes with your mom and dad, were they musical in any way and helping you drive forward in that regard? I think my mom has like her grade eight and piano. So I think she <laughs> plays some piano, uh, but it, she, they were never like, I shouldn't say never. They weren't really like actively playing but they had music on in the house constantly like they're from Timmins so right way up north uh, Ontario and and that's where Shania is from so they would always have Shania on and uh I think they used to like play tennis with her or something so oh, really? I think it was just a cool thing that they thought and they were always playing that and like old rock and things so like many that. musical co- connections in your I family <laughs> I just had to do it I took I took the the heat and went for it you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so you talk about your parents playing music Was it quite a bit of country then growing up? Is that what you gravitated towards? I 
loved Johnny Cash from the get-go, like most people do, especially because my grandpa, I was like, well, if he's into this, I, I want to be. <laughs> so I would try to learn all the all the lyrics to like, you know, I've been everywhere and all those things that you hear him do. Um, so that was always around. Again, it was a lot of like that pop country, like Shania. That was kind of when I was born, that was around. And, right. uh, and old rock. My mom listened to Led Zeppelin and and all that, all that stuff. It was, it was a lot of the hits, honestly, but there was definitely <laughs> country in the mix. And what about your voice? You talk about guitar being sort of maybe in middle school, high school, as far as your voice, when did you start to find that and enjoy singing and realizing you were good at it? Yeah, I, it was a lot of, um, just trial and error. Like I couldn't, I remember not being able to play and sing at the same time for oh, okay. so long. It felt like two years of me, like the timing, it was like this thing, you know, <laughs> like when you're trying to, I still can't do that. <laughs> but, but, uh, I remember just over and over, like for hours, I would try to do that. And I remember once I could like sing a song, it was terrible, but I would, um, I, I, Tried, I was trying to sing higher then because my voice started kind of lower, at least oh, my okay. singing voice when I was learning. So I remember being like, who sings high? And I was like, Justin Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he had that like one time song out around that time, like his first song ever. And right. I remember just starting with, with a capo on, like no capo on a guitar, then capo, just making it higher and higher. And I would learn it in, in one key and then learn it a little bit higher and a little bit higher. I probably did that for like, honestly, a year. <laughs> Wow. I wish it was a, a little, I mean, I love the beef, but I wish that song was a little bit cooler. That story, but <laughs> yeah. what are you going to do? I think he's incredible, like his stuff now, but um, yeah. Are, are you totally self-taught in the singing area? Like, did you have natural talent there or is it a lot of being self-taught and just working at it? It's a lot of being self-taught. Um, now I do like vocal warm-ups and things. I've had a few vocal coaches and, and one that helps me now, Tamara uh, Beatty. She's amazing. And I, I, that's more just to maintain. Cause I have a lot of rasp in my voice and I just, you have to work on it. Like anything, you got to kind of build your chops and make sure you can do it. So right. I do a lot of warming up and things like that. But, uh, for the majority of the first part of my career, it was just self-taught, you know, and playing at bars till like three and having to sing night after night. <laughs> right. Before we get to the bars, I want to hear the story of your first guitar and how you were able to buy that guitar from rummaging <laughs> around the dump. Oh, yeah. I would love going to the dump, especially at my cottage, because at my cottage, there were bears that were at the dump. Right. It was, it was, it was back in the days when it was, a dump was just like a piece of land that had like, it, there was no organization. Yeah. It was just a pile of garbage and bears <laughs> and, and seagulls. Uh, so we would go and I would like try to do anything to like get a bike that I like was missing a chain and wheels and find things like wheels to put on it so I could like work my way up to to a guitar I, I wanted a dirt bike too and I did the same thing with that <laughs> at one point it was weird I was just trying to wheel and deal from uh <laughs> no pun intended yeah uh, from an early age <laughs> well that's not a bad skill to have yeah yeah that's right <laughs> and so let's talk about playing those bars when did that start for you? You talk about that talent show in school and then was it soon after you graduated or while you were still in school that you started to play more out to people? Yeah, I would go to open mics all the time. That's how it started. And I still, before COVID, I was still going to open mics all the time, just trying, cause I'm, I'm like writing, trying to write a lot. So I would just go to open mics by myself or with a friend or whatever, and just try those songs out. So that's what I was doing back then. Uh, more with covers back then. Right. Uh, Cause that's, you got to give the people what they want at bars. <laughs> Otherwise it, I learned quickly. It did not go over well. <laughs> right. Yeah. But um, yeah. So I would do that and, and spent a lot of time doing that. And then I would do corporate gigs because for whatever reason I got in, I played at one insurance uh, company Christmas party oh, okay. in, in Waterloo. And uh, I guess all the other insurance companies heard about it. Cause I, I, I did a tour. I did an insurance company tour. Really? <laughs> yeah. Just me and my, me and my, uh, a guy I play music with called Riley. So oh, yeah, wow. we did that for a while, but there was a lot of bars and corporate events and any, any chance I could, I would play. <laughs> so what was that time in your life? Like, was that you knowing that you wanted to pursue a career in music or was that yeah. you filling time to figure it out? It was a little bit, it was me trying to pursue 
an actual career. Uh, but I think it's tough to figure out. Like for me, it was very tough. I started like when I was like going to do it, I was working with this guy called Zubin Thacker, yeah. who's amazing. I still work with him to this day, but he was always like, find out what you want to do because I was, I was trying to write like pop music for a little while and oh, okay. it just didn't feel like me really. So I spent a lot of years figuring out that it's, it's back to the roots, back to just me and the guitar country. And um, cause that was in me with my, what my parents were listening to and stuff. It made a lot of sense and it, and it does now with this project, but it was a lot of figuring out what I wanted to do in there and, and trying to build chops, like from going, like going from not playing a lot live, just trying to get any show and, and figure out what works and what doesn't. Right. And did you feel comfortable on the stage right away, especially in those bars where no one's necessarily listening to you, no, but you have no, to you play are. like they are. <laughs> yeah. For four hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your, your background music for four hours. But um, I think that helps a lot. Like it, it, it was, it was not comfortable at first, but you get more and more comfortable with like, not necessarily that you're flopping over and over, but people not listening and, and then you start seeing what works, like what turns ahead to, you know, what songs, what tempo, what keys good for my voice. You're figuring all these things out as you're doing it. So right. uh, it, it was amazing. Like even the open mics, I want to go back to playing open mics after <laughs> COVID's over because it's, it's so helpful. You're trying to convince people that don't know who you are, that they should listen to you and, and hear your songs. And, right. And hear your voice. Yeah. When did you hook up with Kira, Isabella? When did mm -hmm. that all start to form and you sort of diverged from the solo act into being mm -hmm. a guitarist for someone else? How did that all happen? Yeah, well, I, uh, Zubin, uh, was MDing. He started playing some country gigs and he got this Kira gig. He was uh, music directing Kira. And oh, okay. I remember being like, that seems so cool. Kira seemed awesome. I went to a couple shows to see him play with the band and her. And um, she was just so nice. And we kind of hit it off right away. And uh, there came a time, I was probably 19, maybe 18 or 19. I'm not good. I'm not good with time, but <laughs> I was pretty young and it was early on. And Zoom was like, if you can learn these acoustic parts and these harmonies, uh, you can come on the road with Kira and me. We're opening for Terry Clark on like a cross Canada tour. Oh, okay. And I was so scared. Cause I was like, I've never done anything like this. That was kind of my first, I play bars and open mics and that sort of thing. But this was like, you got to be rock solid <laughs> for the most part. You can't, I can't mess up my parts. So I spent a lot of time practicing that. And, and then we went on the road, uh, and acoustic tour is scary too, because there is, definitely no room for errors. <laughs> it's, it's, you're so stripped down and on a, you know, it was theaters and uh, I was quiet in there. <laughs> right. And, yeah. So that was like the best, like the, the fact that he, he, him and Kira brought me on that tour, like helped me so much because I got to see how it worked right from the get go, like how touring worked. And we were following Terry's bus and we were driving in like a Ford Explorer expedition <laughs> And I remember we flew out West and we got there and Zubin realized that Kira and I weren't old enough to, to drive the rental car. Oh, really? But, yeah. Cause you can only drive like the, the small compact cars when you're like, just have your G2 or whatever. Right. So he had to, poor guy had to drive the entire way across Canada <laughs> and we had to be there at the same time as the bus, but the, the bus drives overnight, like through the night. So people oh, sleep right. yeah. while the driver drives, but we would have to like, get any sleep we could. And then poor Zubin would have to, you know, get behind a wheel and drive us there. And it was awesome, but yeah, crazy experience. Well, yeah, exactly. Like what is that like in the fact of one day you're playing bars, working towards, I want a solo career to all of a sudden being a part of a band and, and traveling across Canada and being in like, quote unquote, the industry all of a sudden. Yeah. I was like blown away. And I still, I, I think that's like one of the best experiences I've had so far. As I say, it was so crazy seeing, I was in this back seat of this car watching every part of the industry from really no one cared. As long as I played my parts right, I could just <laughs> kind of watch and see how things worked. And um, it was, it was a dream come true. And, and like right then I, I knew that uh, the goal was always going to be a solo career, but in that moment and, for a while, I, I ended up playing with the rec laws too. And yeah, it was just like those experiences were, are like 
one of a kind and I'm so thankful for them. How cool was that in starting with her on the acoustic tour with Terry Clark? And then by the end, you were playing these shows with Keith Urban and Darius Rucker and Jason Aldean and all these big guys. Like, what was it like to sort of have that experience with Kira and build into that? It was amazing. I got to see a lot of her, you know, I'd, I'd like see her off to writing trips and, you know, we need more songs. We, all the struggles that any artist has during their career and the, and the, you know, the great times too, but um, to just be a part of that camp. And, and a lot of those guys, like the players that were playing with her, I still, that they play in my band and, and they play with the rec laws. And it's really cool to see how everyone's kind of coming up and Zubin MDs for Sean Mendez now. And right. it's like, it's seeing everyone and where they're going and specifically the artist that I'm playing for is, is so cool. It's unbelievable. When your time ended with Kira and you moved over to the Rec Laws, was there time in between there that you started to think of a solo career or were you just so in it that you just kind of moved from one to the other and you were still just focused on sort of that band life? Yeah, right towards like when I was getting, like when Kira stuff was wrapping up for me, I met Callum Maudsley, who's now my musical director, and he was filling in for a guitar player uh, in Kira's band. And I knew in my head I wanted to do a solo career. I wasn't saying much about it. I was just kind of trying to write and, and do whatever I could. And, um, and I met him and, and musically we just clicked. So it was like, I think we, I met him twice and he was like, we should get like a house where we just do music all the time. <laughs> so we moved into a house that's actually just down the street. We still live in the neighborhood. Um, and that's when the, the Nate Holler project really started like coming together. Um, and as I say, I still work with him and I will continue to for a long time. Uh, and I, I, we were just writing to words that we were playing with the rec laws, but when we weren't doing that, we were writing music and producing little demos and doing whatever we could to kind of, uh, get that project pushed along. And have you always had the, the solo in the back of your mind or were there times like when you were with Kira that, you sort of forgot about it because how busy you were and how well things were going, just playing guitar in a band. Yeah. I, you definitely like that felt comfortable and so fun being a part of that. But for me, I always, it was always there. I was like, just trying to learn, soak up as much as I could. <laughs> uh, people were just like, be a sponge, just, just learn as much as you can then. And uh, I'm yeah, I, I always had that in my head that the solo thing was going to be the thing, but it was, it was awesome, incredible stepping stones that I, yeah, I can't believe I got the opportunity to do. And during that time, were you involved in writing as well? Did you, were you able to work your chops in writing along with Kira and along with the rec laws at all? Or was that more just on the side that you were doing on your own? Kira and I started writing a little bit. Um, we only did a few sessions here or there. Um, and then I was doing a lot on the side with other people and uh, mainly Callum and, and anyone associated with kind of his stuff. Right. Um, and then he got the rec laws gig actually Callum. Uh, and oh, okay. that's when that kind of stuff happened. And we re we write together still like quite a bit. So, and I hope we continue to do that because we, we have some stuff that's going to come out soon that uh, that they're, writers on as well so oh nice yeah and so in 2016 january on mm -hmm. your social media you had a post that there was going to be a song called holiday that yes. was going to be released was that a, a solo track from you yeah that was stuff i was doing with zubin and he was very much in the pop world at that time and, and still is oh, okay um, obviously but we were just trying some things out and that had a lot more we had done some other stuff that really no one heard uh, that was way more electronic sounding. And uh, this had some acoustic guitars and it was kind of the first time we went back to that. So, well, it didn't end up being the exact vibe I was going for um, at the time I was really excited by it. And I still love that song, but it, 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 it wasn't like we didn't have, I didn't know myself at that point. So right. it, it was cool, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted to be doing. Right. Um, it was a stepping stone to kind of the more organic and thinking maybe that's something that I should follow uh, instead of like 
you know, since. <laughs> right, right. So was country music always going to be what the solo career was? Or did that sort of ebb and flow as you went along as to what that was going to look like? It was a lot of just trial and error. Like this pop thing's not working. Why is it? <laughs> it's because <laughs> I, I didn't grow up. That wasn't, it just wasn't me. It, right. I, I love that stuff, but it, it didn't come naturally to me. What came naturally, I found out is like holding my acoustic guitar and, and writing songs and like telling stories. That's what's so cool about country music. So, um, yeah, I think it was a lot of just like, oh, that didn't work. That people didn't get that. Okay. Back to the drawing board and, and kind of went right back to my roots where it all started. Just, just me and the guitar. Yeah. And in 2018, yep. you hit the stage for the Boots and Hearts Emerging Artist Showcase. Now, how mm -hmm. did that come about? Because it seems like it's out of the blue. And did you have your own material that you were playing during that contest? Yeah, I had a bunch of songs that um, I think a couple of them, I still, I haven't played live much like as the Nate Holler Project, but uh, I think a couple of the songs we had already partially written back then that we still play today. Oh, so. Okay. Um, there was a lot of music that Callum and I in our little home studio had had written or me and uh, Stu and, and Jen wrote a lot of stuff. And we were just playing that at that time. And I just shot a little video and submitted it. Didn't think about it for a while. And then that was it was a really cool experience. Yeah. Talk about that. What was it like hitting the stage on that big of a stage, really, for the first time as a solo act all of a sudden after doing that band thing for so long? What was that feeling like for you? It was, uh, it was awesome. It was a little scary because I didn't have a lot of the other pieces worked out. I didn't have my band fully kind of locked in. I had to figure that out. I had never played with like, you know, the full thing before that was like, do it, do it with, you know, I don't know. It just, it felt way different. The scale was much bigger. Right. So I had to, I had to figure some things out. And even then it wasn't, it wasn't fully what I, the band was great. It's all still guys I play with, but uh, it just wasn't, all of the songs weren't totally there in my mind. And it was, it felt a little pieced together. Right. Whereas now it feels like I have the, I have, I'm focused on what it is that I want to do. And, um, but it was, it was a really cool experience. Very scary, but a lot of fun. And so you made it into the top seven. And when that was over, mm -hmm. was that a spark that, at that point, you said, I'm going to move to a solo career, or did it still take a few months after that to realize now is the time I want to take this step? Yeah, that was, uh, that definitely kind of lit a fire where I was like, I know I can do this. I didn't end up, you know, on top of that, but uh, it was like, uh, I 100% can do this. I, I know I can. It's just figuring out the songs, the, the kind of timeline of when I'll release things. Um, yeah, there were so many things. I, I still obviously day to day, like uh, honing in my, my songwriting, like chops. So right. um, yeah, it wasn't fully there then, but I, I think we're getting closer and closer. And yeah, I'm so excited to get back to live shows. Like it's, it, there's a light now. So it's, I, we got to do the Calgary Stampede and uh, yeah. some other exciting stuff, the Bud Stage shows coming up. So it's going to be it's going to be fun playing all the the new songs for people that have been in the works for for so many years. And through 2019, like did you build a team around you in preparation for releasing a single in 2020 or is this process really just been you and those guys that you've mentioned that you've known, you know, since the beginning that you're still working with? Well, I work with most of those people still, uh, but I started meeting like through the rec laws. I met the whole star seed camp and, and mm. Shannon and, uh, and I started meeting some of their contacts and working with, with them. A lot of the guys down in Nashville doing some zoom rights like Todd Clark and, and Travis Wood and Gavin Slate have been really kind of instrumental in all this too. Oh, okay. uh, and Stu and Jen, they were, they were really nice to take me under their wing and be like, you know, talk to Shannon, talk to Mike who are now my managers. And, uh, and see what they think about stuff. I was bouncing ideas and it was, it came pretty naturally and, and it was casual at first, <laughs> uh, but, uh, we took it to the next level. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's been amazing working with those, those guys and kind of just expanding the team, keeping the same kind of, you know, 
keeping it all true to what I want to do, but right. they, they got the kind of vision that I had and, and Calum had early on and, and yeah, it's been awesome. And with lightning in a bottle, was it released when it was supposed to, did you have any apprehensions about releasing your very first single as a solo artist when you did in 2020 and maybe waiting till it could possibly get out there more or were you just focused on getting a single out there? Well, I, as, as I said, like I, I was writing for so many years, we had a lot of songs and kind of last minute, I, we had maybe a different plan of what the first single was going to be. Um, we weren't exactly sure on the date. Uh, right. And then I heard, cause I'm actually not a writer on lightning, uh, yeah. Sean Austin, Travis Wood and Gavin Slate wrote it. And uh, I think maybe Shannon sent it to me and was like, what do you think of this? And I was like, this is so, I loved it. It just felt like something I related to. And I thought other people were going to. So we, we put my voice on it and, and it kind of just naturally came like that. And it was just something people are going to hear, you know, stuff that I'm a writer on definitely in my project in the, in the, you know, coming months, but, uh, I just, I just knew I had to do that song. So it was, it was kind of just came, came naturally and weird time to release. Like it, I would love to be doing interviews like this in person and, <laughs> and meeting radio hosts and PDs and all sorts of stuff. But, um, it was really cool at the stampede hearing, cause it's been on the radio and hearing people sing the song back. Like it, it was, it was a crazy moment. Uh, so I, I think I'm glad we did it that way, but it definitely was a strange time during it, uh, during COVID. And was it strange, like you say, after all these years of writing yourself and having all these songs written, was mm -hmm. it strange to kick things off with a song that you didn't write after all? I thought about it. I was like, do I want people to hear something I wrote at first? And I think that song speaks to my project really well. So that didn't bother me. Like I was excited and really appreciative that those guys were cool with me cutting that song. Uh, and I think it, it kind of goes along with what you're going to hear uh, in the future. And it's a great starting place for me. And uh, it just made sense with, with the project. So it, it, no hesitations. Right. And grew up on your second single, very much based on you growing up. Mm -hmm. How exciting is it to release a song like that as a new artist that, represents who you are and can tell the fans this is yeah. who i am it was awesome that was actually the first song i wrote with uh todd uh travis and gavin and we wrote it over zoom so i was really nervous because those guys are awesome and i was like just come in with okay ideas and blah blah, blah. and um yeah it was it was a, a really cool experience working with them and telling the story and just hearing about their upbringings and and what went into you know kind of what shaped them and um it was cool shooting the video too for it because i got to go home and and see all the places that i hadn't been in so long i'd like <laughs> mountain bike dad and you know all these crazy things that i did and the way i came up and kind of putting that visual to the song was was really cool too and now you talked about the calgary stampede mm -hmm. tell me what it was like like just emotionally for you your was it your first your like your very first show other than boots and hearts as a solo artist yeah it was like it was the it was like the real thing <laughs> and we were like you know we had songs out for real and uh so it was so surreal and and the the covid stuff there like they it, it all felt very safe but there was a lot of people and yeah. it was it was the adrenaline was through the roof and <laughs> I think people need live music so bad. Like I know I do. So to have everyone in there, everyone was so, so psyched up to be there and seeing shows again. So unbelievable experience. And you've done it thousands of times. You've jumped up on stage with your guitar to play to yeah. crowds far bigger than that. But was it a different feeling seeing as you were front and center this time? hundred percent. It was it was crazy. It was like just heightened even that feeling that I love so much about playing or to any crowd or playing guitar for another artist. It was just, uh, yeah, all the, all the kind of writing work and working on my guitar and my vocals. It was all, it's all like writing, like I believe myself. So it was just writing on like, let's just do it now. It's, <laughs> it's, it's time. So it was a wild feeling. Yeah. And there's gotta be nerves, even though lightning in a bottle is doing huge things on radio you never know when you're singing it if 
people are going to sing it back or, or what the response is ultimately going to be when you get out to that live show. So yeah. when you played that song at the Stampede, what was it like? Yeah, well, it closed. It was the last song I played. So it, it was it was insane because it was it's been just kind of people have been hearing it on playlists or radio and and to hear, you know, that many people sing it back out of essentially <laughs> seeing more than like no more than four people <laughs> before that uh, <laughs> that were all my friends. <laughs> right. in my house. So it was mind blowing. And like I was like right back into it, though, and, and can't wait for more. <laughs> And how much confidence does it give you in the fact that you released your music during COVID and the response that it's had without even getting out there to play it and promote it and, you know, how much more it can, it can sort of skyrocket now that you are able to get out there a bit and promote yourself and get yourself out there. Yeah, I I, it gives me a lot of confidence, uh, but I, I'm also just so appreciative of, of like country radio and anyone who's helped me get on playlists and things like that. Like it's, it, those things go s- like so far. So now I just want to make sure like my live show holds up and, and now that I'm going to actually be able to get there and, you know, slap fives with people in the front <laughs> row and, and see the people is, is going to be unreal. So I'm going to really make sure my live shows tight, as tight as possible And uh, hopefully they'll be just as receptive for for coming singles and and releases. And with those coming singles, do you have to make sure that um, expectations are sort of tempered because of the success that Lightning in a Bottle has had? Do you have to make sure you're not going into every release thinking that every single is going to have that success? Yeah, I just I, I try not to think too much about where it might land on a chart or anything. Obviously that really excites me and I, I'm blown away when that happens, but I just want to make sure it's the songs we're releasing are true to me and um, that I think people are going to react to it because all of my favorite artists, I, I believe, I believe what they're saying. I believe, you know, some songs might be crazy and out there or whatever, but for some reason fans see through the, the BS, I think yeah. is basically what I'm saying. So I want to just, from song to song, make sure I'm proud of what I'm putting out. And I think hopefully people will will see that and enjoy it. (laughs) And so what is it like recording a song like lightning in a bottle when you've written for yourself for so long, and then you have this song that's given to you, do you have to make sure that when you're in the recording studio, you're really paying attention to making it your own and making people feel how much it means to you? Yeah. I mean, I think just, from the fact that it, I reacted so positively to it and I felt something, it was a lot of listening to it over and over and trying to get, you know, figure out where I'm going to put inflections on words and, and how I'm going to do it. And uh, Todd, uh, my producer really helps and and Travis and Gavin, they, they're so helpful with that kind of stuff when recording is like, you know, really feel what I'm saying and, and, you know, (laughs) do it justice. Like when it's something I didn't, didn't write on but I think just the fact that I was connecting to it really helped right off the bat that's really interesting to talk about like you say the inflections and where it goes and I don't know if people understand that I think a lot of the times people on the outside just think that the artist goes into the booths and just sings their part and then it's done but there is a lot of work there right to make sure that you're putting the proper emotion into the song Mm mm-hmm I think it's a lot of just feeling it in general, but then actually thinking about it, like you're saying, like thinking about like, okay, this is actually what I'm saying because a lot of times like I'm, it'll take a while to write some of these. This, this one's not a good example of that, but uh, for grew up on and things like I'm singing in a certain way and it it doesn't really make sense if you hear the words. So, and when you're doing it for hours on end, trying to, you know, change lyrics and switch things and put this word here, you start, not thinking about what you're doing as much with the actual singing of the words <laughs> right? I find, and, and keeping the melodies right and, and true to how you write them on the day you write them and, and tweaking them if they need it and things like that. So a lot goes into it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a strange process. <laughs> and it's made even stranger by COVID. And I know you've been working with Todd Clark down in Nashville and that is basically all online when he's producing oh, yeah. the stuff, you're just basically watching it on your phone. And so what has that process been like in getting the new music going and, and creating a release schedule for it? 
Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot. There's this crazy program called Audio Movers that uh, allows basically me to hear Todd work on production uh, in real time. So I just I'm texting him and listening to him work, and he can listen to me sing things in uh, in real time as well. So having like a little home studio and Callum around to help me capture it properly and, and Todd helping and Gavin and, and, and Trav has been like unbelievable. It's so strange. It's crazy what technology can do though. Like the fact that he can be in Nashville and, you know, press a button and I can hear what he's working on there. It's, it's wild. <laughs> <laughs> and so what does the future hold? Do you have a release schedule for more music later this year? There's going to be more music for sure. I don't have an exact date. Um, we're still trying to figure everything out and, uh, and plan it, but it, it's going to be sooner rather than later. I can say that. And you are playing, you mentioned is in September with Dean Brody, the rec laws, Jade Eagleson. So yeah. in those live shows, do you have some music that you're previewing that people are going to hear in future releases? Absolutely. They're going to, they're going to hear a lot of the new stuff and, um, that's, in, that's insane. Tickets are on sale and I'm, I'm, it's close to my hometown. So right. uh, I'm going to have some, some friends and family there. And I think it's going to be a, a crazy night. That's got to be pretty big playing with those. Well, especially Dean Brody, like one mm-hmm. of the top guys in Canadian country. Like it's got to be a pretty cool feeling this early on to be sharing a stage with people like that. Yeah. I'm so, so thankful they're having me on that show. And uh, it's going to be wild. Cause yeah, rec laws are on, you know, a lot of my friends are just going to be around playing music. <laughs> Dean's been really nice to me and, uh, it's going to be wild. As I say, my parents will be there and yeah, it's going to be cool. <laughs> I can't wait. And over the past year, like you talk about your friends being there, you live with Stu from the rec laws. And yep. like I say, you're still buddies with a lot of the guys you came up with. And so what <laughs> have those relationships meant for you over the past year in just helping support you and guide you and make sure that you're sort of, sort of not going crazy in, yeah. in managing all of this? Yeah, it's been unbelievable. Like, so I live with Stu and, and Callum and having them just even on a, on a personal level during COVID, like having roommates was amazing because we were able to hang out and, and then we just started working on stuff. And I think kind of right at the beginning, there's a lot of negatives from COVID obviously for everyone. Uh, but this was a bit of a silver lining for me uh, to, to have them here and to be able to work on music with them day to day when we're, we're locked down. It, yeah, it, it was, uh, it was a really cool experience. Uh, so crazy because we didn't know what was going on no one did but yeah. um really really lucky that we were able to work and and create well while, while all this was going on that's awesome well congratulations yeah. on Thank the you. success already that you've Thank been able so to much. achieve and with the show coming up and hopefully over the next few months we'll have more shows popping up and then i don't know maybe early next year we'll see a full canadian tour hopefully that would be unbelievable. And yeah, I can't wait to get out and, and press the palms and see the people, you know? So, uh, but appreciate uh, you chatting with me today. Thank you guys once again so much for listening. And thank you to Nate for stopping by and sharing his story. Be sure to check out his singles, Lightning in a Bottle and Grew Up On and keep a lookout for new music coming throughout the year. Please also make sure to like, share, follow, subscribe to us on whatever streaming service you are listening on. You can leave a review, a rating, tell your friends, your family, your neighbors to come on over and have a listen. That support is huge for us. Thank you once again for listening, and we'll see you next time on Country Music Made Me. (laughs) 